Oh wait. Make sure that there's my uh, audio is that. Looks fine. <laughs> Hello, good evening. Mark Henry here. I have narrowly dodged having the hiccups. They just stopped. He might be speaking too soon. He's had the hiccups for a while now. No, they're gone. No, shh. They're gone. We shouldn't speak their name. <coughs> All right. Quoth goes to Hogwarts. Chapter 40 On the Horns. <coughs> After Hem dismissed his class, news of what I had done spread through the university like wildfire. I guessed from the students' reactions that Master Hem was not particularly well-loved. As I sat on a stone bench outside the mews, passing students smiled in my direction. Others waved or gave laughing thumbs up. While I enjoyed the notoriety, a cold anxiety was slowly growing in my gut. I'd made an enemy of one of the nine masters. I needed to know how much trouble I was in. Yeah, now he feels regret. Good to know he's still 15 in some senses. Dinner in the mess was brown bread with butter, stew, and beans. Sounds good. Minette was there, his wild hair making him look like a great white wolf. Simon and Savoy groused idly about the food making grim speculations as to what manner of meat was in this stew. To me, less than a span away from the streets of Tarbion, it was a marvelous meal indeed. Nevertheless, I was rapidly losing my appetite in the face of what I was hearing from my friends. Oh, man. I swear, sometimes this microphone is louder than other nights. Check, check. Okay, so right now I was like... It probably sounded like I was distorting the crap out of this mic, just like yelling right into it. G Hammett. Oh, it's G Hammett. Hello. Oh, that's so cute. Thank you for making an account just to say hi to me. Um, like I was saying, last night I had this microphone on Minus two decibels, which means it was turned down like one notch on your stereo. Just now I realized that it was clipping, so I turned it down, and 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 only now is it not clipping. And we're at negative 17 decibels. I've always thought it was more like the Impressionist artist's name. You always thought what was more like the Impressionist artist's name? Sovoy? Simon? Oh, like like Monet, like Manet. Yeah, that could be that could be a French name. I'll go with that. It ends in a T. Nevertheless, I was rapidly losing my appetite in the face of what I was hearing from my friends. Don't get me wrong, Sovoy said. You've got a great weighty pair on you. I'll never call that into question, but still, he gestured with his spoon. They're going to string you up for this. Hey. If he's lucky, Simon said. I mean, we are talking about malfeasance here, aren't we? It's not a big deal, I said with more assurance than I felt. I gave him a little bit of a hot foot, that's all. Any harmful sympathy falls under malfeasance, Manet pointed at me with his piece of bread, his wild, grizzled eyebrows arching seriously over his nose. You've got to pick your battles. Keep your head down around the masters. They can make your life a real hell once you get into their bad books. 
He started it, I said sullenly through a mouthful of beans. Mm -hmm. We found a Wikipedia article on Mr. Manet. Oh. So Manet is an actual impressionistic artist distinct from Monet. That's interesting. That kind of sucks for Manet. <laughs> All right, cool. I learned so much about art on these streams. Yesterday I got art sniped by some, actually by some French impressionistic art that Stephanie sent me. A young boy jogged up to the table, breathless. Your quoth? he asked, looking me over. I nodded, my stomach suddenly turning over. They want you in the master's hall. Where is it? I asked. I've only been here a couple of days. Can one of you show him? The boy asked, looking around the table. I've got to go tell Jamison I found him. I'll do it, Simon said, pushing away his bowl. I'm not hungry anyway. Jemison's runner boy took off, and Simmons started to get to his feet. Hold on, I said, pointing to my tray with my spoon. I'm not finished here. Simmons' expression was anxious. I can't believe you're eating, he said. I can't eat. How can you eat? I'm hungry, I said. I don't know what's waiting in the master's hall, but I'm guessing I'd rather have a full stomach for it. You're going on the horns, Mena said. It's the only reason they'd call you there at this time of night. I didn't know what he meant by that, but I didn't want to advertise my ignorance to everyone in the room. They can wait until I'm done. I took another bite of stew. Simon returned to his seat and poked idly at his food. Truth be told, I wasn't really hungry anymore, but it galled me to be pulled away from a meal after all the times I'd been hungry in Tarbian. When Simon and I finally got to our feet, the normal clamor in the mess quieted as folk watched us leave. They knew where I was headed. Outside, Simon put his hands in his pockets and headed roughly in the direction of Hollows. All kidding aside, you're in a good bit of trouble, you know. I was hoping Hem would be embarrassed and keep quiet about it, I admitted. Do they expel many students? I tried to make it sound like a joke. There hasn't been anyone this term, Sim said with his shy, blue-eyed smile. But it's only the second day of classes. You might set some sort of record. This isn't funny, I said, but found myself wearing a grin regardless. Simon could always make me smile, no matter what was going on. Sim led the way, and we reached hollows far too soon for my liking. Simon raised a hand in, the, in a hesitant farewell as I opened the door and made my way inside. I was met by Jamison. He oversaw everything that wasn't under direct control of the masters, the kitchens, the laundry, the stables, the stockrooms. He was nervous and bird-like, a man with the body of a sparrow and the eyes of a hawk. Jameson escorted me into a large windowless room with a familiar crescent-shaped table. The chancellor sat at the center, as he had during admissions. The only real difference was that his, this table was not elevated, and the seated masters were close to eye level with me. The eyes I met were not friendly. Jameson escorted me to the front of the crescent table. Seeing it from this angle made me understand the references to being on the horns. Jameson retreated to a smaller s table of his own, dipping a pen. The Chancellor steepled his fingers and spoke without preamble. On the fourth of Cadelin, Hem called the masters together. Jameson's pen scratched across a piece of paper, occasionally dipping back into the inkwell at the top of the desk. The Chancellor continued formally. Are all the masters present? Master Physicker, said Ar Ar Arwill. Master Archivist, said Lauren, his face impassive as ever. Master Arithmetician, Brandur said, cracking his knuckles absently. Master Artificer, grumbled Kilvin without looking up from the tabletop. Master Alchemist, said Mandrag. Master Rhetorician, Hem's face was fierce and red. Master Sympathist, 
said Elk Sadal. Master Namer, Elodin actually smiled at me. Not just a perfunctory curling of the lips, but a warm, toothy grin. I drew a bit of a shaky breath, relieved that at least one person present didn't seem ang- eager to hang me up by my thumbs. Ugh! The time travel continues! I did not misread that. Fourth of Caitlin. Weird. That's just so weird. Like, why? (laughs) And Master Linguist, said the Chancellor. All eight, he frowned. Sorry, strike that. All nine masters are present. Present your grievance, Master Hem. Hmm, what did that mean? Hem did not hesitate. Today, first term student quoth, not the Arcanum. Not of the Arcanum, did perform sympathetic bindings on me with malicious intent. Two grievances are recorded against Quoth by Master Hem, the Chancellor said sternly, not taking his eyes away from me. First grievance, unauthorized use of sympathy. What is the proper discipline for this, Master Archivist? For unauthorized use of sympathy leading to injury, the offending student will be bound and whipped a number of times, not less than two, no more than ten, singly, across the back. Lauren said it as if reading off directions for a recipe. Number of lashes sought? The Chancellor looked at Hem. Hem paused to consider. Five. I felt the blood drain from my face, and I forced myself to take a slow, deep breath through my nose to calm myself. Does any master object to this? The Chancellor looked around the table, but all mouths were silent. All eyes were stern. The second grievance, malfeasance. Master Archivist, four to fifteen single lashes and expulsion from the university, Loran said in a level voice. Lashes sought? Hem stared directly at me. Eight. Thirteen lashes and expulsion. A cold sweat swept over me, and I felt nausea in the pit of my stomach. I had known fear before. In Tarbian, it was never far away. Fear kept you alive, but I had never before felt such a desperate helplessness. A fear not just for my body being hurt, but for my entire life being ruined. I began to get lightheaded. Do you understand these grievances said against you? The Chancellor asked sternly. I took a deep breath. Not exactly, sir. I hated the way my voice sounded, tremulous and weak. The Chancellor held up a hand, and Jameson lifted his pen from the paper. It is against the laws of the university for a student who is not a member of the Arcanum to use sympathy without permission from a master. His expression darkened. And it is always, always expressly forbidden to cause harm with sympathy, especially to a master. A few hundred years ago, Arcanists were hunted down and burned for things of that sort. We do not tolerate that sort of behavior here. I heard a hard edge creep into the Chancellor's voice. Only then did I sense how truly angry he was. He took a deep breath. Now, do you understand? I nodded shakily. He made another motion to Jameson, who set his pen back to the paper. Do you, quoth, understand these grievances set against you? Yes, sir, I said, as steadily as I could. Everything seemed too bright, and my legs were trembling slightly. I tried to force them to be still, but it only seemed to make them shake all the more. Do you have anything to say in your defense? The Chancellor asked curtly. I just wanted to leave. I felt the stares of the masters bearing down at me, on me. My hands were wet and cold. I probably would have shaken my head and slunk from the room had the Chancellor not spoken again. Well, the Chancellor repeated testily, no defense? The words struck a chord in me. They were the same words that Ben had used a hundred times as he drilled me endlessly in argument. His words came back, admonishing me. What? No defense? Any student of mine might be, must be able to defend his ideas against an attack. No matter how you spend your life, your wit will defend you more often than a sword. Keep it sharp. I took another deep breath, closed my eyes, and concentrated. After a long moment, I felt the cool impassivity of the heart of stone surround me. 
My trembling stopped. <laughs> Tomorrow the 5th of Caitlin? Okay, so that's why they changed it to 4th. Because <laughs> internal consistency... I said fourth, right? Mm, yeah, okay. Well, that settles that mystery. <laughs> I was so confused about why they would change that. I'm confused about how he messed that up in the first place. But I feel like I nitpicked too much already. I opened my eyes and heard my own voice say, I had permission for my use of sympathy, sir. The Chancellor gave me a long, hard look before saying, What? I held the heart of stone around me like a calming mantle. I had permission from Master Hem, both express and implied. The Masters stirred in their seats, puzzled. The Chancellor looked far from pleased. Explain yourself. I approached Master Hem after his first lecture and told him I was already familiar with the concepts he had discussed. He told me we would discuss it the next day. When he arrived for class the next day, he announced that I would be giving the lecture in order to demonstrate the principles of sympathy. After observing what materials were available, I gave the class the first demonstration my master gave me. Not true, of course. As I've already mentioned, my first lesson involved a handful of iron drabs. It was a lie, but a plausible lie. Judging by the master's expressions, this was news to them. Somewhere deep in the heart of stone, I relaxed, glad that the master's irritation was based on Hem's angrily abridged version of the truth. You gave a demonstration before the class, the chancellor asked before I could continue. He glanced at Hem, then back to me. Whew, Hem didn't tell them that. I played innocent. Just a simple one. Is that unusual? It is a little odd, he said, looking at Hem. I could sense his anger again, but this time it didn't seem to be directed at me. I thought it might be the way you proved your knowledge of the material and moved to a more advanced class, I said innocently. Another lie, but again, plausible. Elk Zadal spoke up. What did the demonstration involve? A wax doll, a hair from Hem's head, and a candle. I would have picked a different example, but my materials were limited. I thought that might be another part of the test, making do with what you were given. I shrugged again. I couldn't think of any other way to demonstrate all three laws with the materials on hand. The Chancellor looked at Hem. Is what the boy says true? Hem opened his mouth as if he would deny it, then apparently remembered that an entire classroom full of students had witnessed the exchange. He said nothing. Damn it, Hem, Elksa Dahl bur burst out. You let the boy make a simulacra of you, then bring him here on malfeasance? He spluttered. You deserve worse than you got. Elir Kvoth could not have hurt him with just a candle, Kilvin muttered. He gave his fingers a puzzled look, as if he were working something out in his head. Not with hair and wax, maybe blood and clay. Order, the Chancellor's voice was too quiet to be called a shout. Oops. But it carried the same authority. He shot looks at Elksa Dahl and Kilvin. Quoth, answer Master Kilvin's question. I made a second binding between the candle and a brazier to illustrate the law of conservation. Kilvin didn't look up from his hands. Wax and hair, he grumbled as if not entirely satisfied with my explanation. I gave a half-puzzled, half-embarrassed look and said, I don't understand it myself, sir. I should have gotten 10% transference at best. It shouldn't have been enough to blister Master Hem, let alone burn him. I turned to Hem. I really didn't mean any harm, sir, I said in my best distraught voice. It was just supposed to be a bit of a hot foot to make you jump. The fire hadn't been going more than five minutes, and I didn't imagine that a fresh fire at 10% could hurt you. I even wrung my hands a little, every bit the distraught student. It was a good performance. My father would have been proud. Well, it did, Hem said bitterly. And where is the damn mo uh, momet, anyway? Momet. I guess that is the doll. 
I demand you return it at once. I'm afraid I can't, sir. I destroyed it. It was too dangerous to leave lying around. Hem gave me a shrewd look. It's of no real concern, he muttered. He refers to a clipping of hair. The Chancellor took up the reins again. This changes things considerably. Hem, do you still set grievance against Quoth? Hem glared and said nothing. I move to strike both grievances, Arwil said, the physicker's old voice coming as, bit of a, as a bit of a surprise. If Hem set him in front of the class, he gave permission, and it isn't malfeasance if you give him your hair and watch him stick it on the mommet's head. I expected him to have more control over what he was doing, Hem said, shooting a venomous look at me. It's not malfeasance, Arwell said doggedly, glaring at him from behind his spectacles, the grandfatherly lines on his face forming a fierce scowl. It would fall under reckless use of sympathy, Lauren interjected coolly. Is that a motion to strike the previous two grievances and replace them with reckless use of sympathy? asked the Chancellor, trying to regain a semblance of formality. Aye, said Arwill, still glaring fearsomely at Hem through his spectacles. All for the motion? the Chancellor said. There was a chorus of eyes from everyone but Hem. Against? Hem remained silent. Master Archivist, what is the discipline for reckless use of sympathy? If one is injured by reckless use of sympathy, the offending student will be whipped singly, no more than seven times across the back. I wondered what book Master Loren was reciting from. Number of lashes sought? Hem looked at the other master's faces, realizing the tide had turned against him. My foot is blistered halfway to my knee, he gritted. Three lashes. The chancellor cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Does any master oppose this action? I, Elksadal and Kilvin said together. Who wishes to suspend the discipline, vote by show of hands. Elksadal, Kilvin, and Arwell raised their, vo their hands at once, followed by the Chancellor. Mandrag kept his hand down, as did Loren, Brander, and Hem. Elidin grim grinned at me cheerily, but did not raise his hand. I kicked myself for my recent trip to the archives and the bad impression it made on Lauren. If not for that, he might have tipped things in my favor. I don't know about that. It's nothing personal with Lauren. Four and a half in favor of suspending punishment, the Chancellor said after a pause. And a half? The discipline stands. Three lashes to be served tomorrow, the third at Equus at noon. As I was deep into the heart of stone, all I felt was a slight analytical curiosity about what it would be like to be publicly whipped. All the masters showed signs of preparing to stand and leave, but before things could, could, could be called to a close, I spoke up. Chancellor. He took a deep breath and let it out in a gush. Yes. During my admission, you said that my admittance to the Arcanum was granted contingent upon proof that I had mastered the basic principles of sympathy. I quoted him nearly word for word. Does this constitute proof? Both Hem and the Chancellor opened their mouth to say something. Hem was louder. Look here, you little cocker! <laughs> Hem! The Chancellor snapped. Then he turned to me. I'm afraid proof of mastery requires more than a simple sympathetic binding. A double binding, Gilvin corrected gruffly. Elodin spoke, seeming to startle everyone at the table. I can think of students currently enrolled in the Arcanum who would be hard-pressed to complete a double binding, let alone draw enough heat to blister a man's foot to the knee. I had forgotten how Elodin's light voice moved through the deep places in your chest when he spoke. He smiled happily at me again. Oh, that wasn't the voice I chose for him earlier. I have him confused with... I don't know. I need to make notes. I wasn't prepared for nine characters that I wanted to give. I really want to give them different voices, but I can't keep track of them that well. There was a moment of quiet reflection. True enough, admitted Elksadal, giving me a close look. The Chancellor looked down at the empty table for a minute. Then he shrugged, looked up, and gave a surprisingly jaunty smile. 
All in favor of admitting first-term student quotes, reckless use of sympathy as proof of mastery of the basic principles of sympathy, vote by show of hands. Kilvin and El- Elxadal raised their hands together. Arwell added his a moment later. Elidin waved. After a pause, the Chancellor raised his hand as well, saying, Five and a half in favor of quotes admission to the Arcanum. Motion passed. Meeting dismissed. Telu shelter us, fools and children all, he said the last very softly as he rested his forehead against the heel of his hand. He keeps saying and a half. Is it, whose vote is worth a half and why? And how would that... Uh, and how would that matter in a table of nine people? Well, oh, well, it, you can split. Way. Somebody split without us noticing. Or maybe, um, good. Uh, did I say the third of Equus? Well, note that you're using a different book now than you were before, because you're using my copy, which is Stephanie's copy, which it's, is signed by the author, so it's got to be right. Yes. He, by signing that, ag- agreed and affirmed that everything in this book is true and correct, according to the best of his knowledge. Anyway, um... Oh. Okay. Um, well, I, I realize why you might want a half vote, which is so that the vote can be tied in a in a council of nine, which is, I don't know, do you, why would you want the vote to be tied? Really. And also, if he is 1.5, then who is 0.5 of a vote? Yeah, someone else needs... Yeah, no, that no, doesn't make sense. and then the total will be out of 9.5. Sage says Elodin generally doesn't go. The total is out of 9.5. Yeah, I don't know. Because so you have nine, tra- you have nine masters, and one of them has a one point five vote, which means that the total will be up to nine point five. Also, hi Sage. I don't remember saying a date. Close admission to the Arcanum. But remember, the dates are going to be. Different oh, he said, okay. yeah, okay. He says tomorrow, the third of Equus at noon. I think the book is just wrong. I am bibbity baffled. Why would they? Why would it be wrong? And then they change it to be wrong again. Mm. It's and every book so far, every date so far has been changed. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't that true? So I feel like I feel like he realized that some important date he wanted to change it. And he wanted to change it a certain number of days. Although maybe if Sage is a second edition, that could be why hers is different. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But I kind of like my theory, which is that the dates... My theory explains why all the dates have changed yet are still wrong. Which is... So my idea is that all the dates were wrong. No one noticed or fixed it. Then he wanted to change this pivotal date. So he moved all the dates in the book by a set amount and didn't and didn't fix them in the process yeah that's weird though well since i have read up through chapter 18 and now i'm listening to chapter 40 i don't think i can contribute too much to this And I think we're like in a very unique situation where we can actually notice it because someone's reading aloud and another person is following along in their own book. Mm -hmm. I think, I feel like that's the only way you're going to notice that this is going on, which is why there's no Reddit thread on it. I know I'm going to post this as a marketing opportunity. It's a, it's a chance for me to market while still bringing value to people. I'm really bad at marketing because Marketing's shitty and stupid. Okay. Um, Telu shelter us, fools and children all. Hem stormed out the room with Brandir in tow. Once they were through the door, I heard Brandir asked, Weren't you wearing a gram? No, I wasn't, Hem snapped. And don't take that tone with me, as if this were my fault. He might as well blame someone stabbed in an alley for not wearing armor. We should all take precautions, Brandir said, placatingly. 
you know as well as their voices were cut off with the sound of a door closing. Kilvin stood and shrugged his shoulders, stretching. Looking over to where I stood, he scratched his bushy beard with both hands, a thoughtful look on his face, then strode over to where I stood. Do you have your sigildry yet, Ilir Kvoth? I looked at him blankly. Do you mean runes, sir? I'm afraid not. Kilvin ran his hands through his beard, thoughtfully. Do not bother with the basic artificing class you have signed for. Instead, you will come to my workroom tomorrow. Noon. I'm afraid I have another appointment at noon, Master Kilvin. Hmm, uh, yes, he frowned. First bell, then. I'm afraid the boy will be having an appointment with my folk shortly after the whipping, Kilvin, Arwell said with a glimmer of amusement in his eyes. Have someone bring you to the Medica afterwards, son. We'll stitch you back together. Thank you, sir. Arwell nodded and made his way out of the room. Kilvin watched him go, then turned back to me, then turned to look at me. My workshop, day after tomorrow, noon. The tone of his voice implied that it wasn't really a question. I would be honored, Master Kilvin. He grunted in response and left with Elksa Dahl. That left me alone with the still-seated Chancellor. We stared at each other while the sound of footsteps faded in the hallway. I brought myself back up out of the heart of stone and felt a tangle of anticipation and fear at everything that had just happened. I'm sorry to be in so much trouble so soon, sir, I offered hesitantly. Oh, he said, his expression considerably less stern now that we were alone. How long had you intended to wait? At least a span, sir. My brush with disaster had left me feeling giddy with relief. I felt an irrepressible g grin bubble onto my face. At least a span, he muttered. The Chancellor put his face into his hands and rubbed, then looked up and surprised me with a wry smile. I realized he wasn't particularly old when his face wasn't locked in a stern expression. Probably only on the far side of forty. You don't look like someone who knows he's going to be whipped tomorrow, he observed. I pushed the thought aside. I imagine I'll heal, sir. He gave me an odd look. It took me a while to recognize it as the one I'd grown accustomed to in the troop. He opened his mouth to speak, but I jumped on the words before he could say them. I'm not as young as I look, sir. I know it. I just wish other people knew it, too. I imagine they will before too long. He gave me a long look before pushing himself up from the table. He held out a hand. Welcome to the Arcanum. I shook his hand solemnly, and we parted ways. I worked my way outside and was surprised to see that it was full night. I breathed in a lungful of sweet spring air and felt my grin resurface. Then someone touched me on the shoulder. I jumped fully two feet into the air and narrowly avoided falling on Simon in the howling, scratching, biting blur that had been my only method of defense in Tarbian. <laughs> he took a step back, startled by the expression on my face. I tried to slow my pounding heart. Simon, I'm sorry, I, I just... Try to make a little more noise around me? I startle easily. Me too, he murmured shakily, wiping a hand across his forehead. I can't really blame you, though. Riding the horns will do that to the best of us. How did things go? I'm to be whipped and admitted to the Arcanum. He looked at me curiously, trying to see if I was making a joke. I'm sorry? Congratulations? He made a shy smile at me. Do I buy you a bandage or a beer? I smiled back. Both. By the time I got back to the fourth floor of the Mews, rumor of my non-expulsion and admission into the Arcanum had spread ahead of me. I was greeted by a smattering of applause from my bunkmates. Hem was not well loved. Some of my bunkmates offered odd congratulations while Basil made a special uh, Basil <laughs> made a special point of coming forward to shake my hand. I had just climbed up to a sitting position on my bunk and was explaining to Basil the difference between a single whip and a six tail when the third-floor steward came looking for me. He instructed me to pack up my things, explaining that Arcanum students were located in the West Wing. He bunked with them for a day? Everything I owned still fit, fit neatly into my travel sack, so it was no great chore. 
As the steward led me away, there was a chorus of goodbyes from my fellow first term students. I guess that was, that was supposed to be longer than a day, right? I don't know. I wasn't, I don't know. Given that the dates are screwed up, I don't think anyone for not knowing how long it's been. It was negative three days. <laughs> uh, the yeah, west. bonding of negative three days. The west wing bunks were similar to those I had left behind. It was still rows of narrow beds, but here they weren't stacked two feet high. Uh, too high. They weren't stacked too high. That's that's two of the number. <laughs> Each bed had a small wardrobe and desk in addition to a trunk. Nothing fancy, but definitely a step up. The biggest difference was in the attitudes of my bunkmates. There were scowls and glares, though for the most part I was pointedly ignored. It was a chilly reception, especially in light of the welcome I had just received from my non-Arcanum bunkmates. It was easy to understand why. Most students attended the university for several terms before being admitted into the Arcanum. Everyone here had worked their way up through the ranks the hard way. I hadn't. Only about three quarters of the bunks were full. I picked one in the back corner, away from the others. I hung my one extra shirt and my cloak in the wardrobe, and put my travel sack in the trunk at the foot of the bed. I lay down and stared at the ceiling. My bunk lay outside the light of the other students' candles and sympathy lamps. I was finally a member of the Arcanum, in some ways exactly where I had always wanted to be. Okay, let me, and let me, uh, yeah, I know. I'm just trying to anticipate how many I'm going to want to read tomorrow, try to plan for that. Because it's been 45 minutes Although I did start late, so I feel like I owe dear viewers a, cu a, a couple more pages. See, it's just a few pages. Yep. I think this is like a perfect chunk for tomorrow. No, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do one more. Since I did start late. <clears throat> Although my voice is surprisingly tired tonight. Chapter 41. Friend's Blood. The next morning I woke early, washed up, and grabbed a bite to eat at the mess. Then, because I had nothing to do before my whipping at noon, I strolled the university aimlessly. I wandered through a few apothecaries and bottle shops, admired the well-kept lawns and gardens. Eventually I came to rest on a stone bench in a wide courtyard. Too anxious to think of doing anything productive, I simply sat and enjoyed the weather, watching the wind tumble a few scraps of waste paper along the cobblestones. It wasn't too long before Willem strolled over and sat himself next to me without an invitation. His characteristic Keldish dark hair and eyes made him seem older than Simon and me but he still had the slightly awkward look of a boy who wasn't quite used to being man-sized yet. Nervous, he asked with the harsh burr a Siaru accent makes. Trying not to think about it, actually, I said. Willem grunted. We were both quiet for a minute while we watched the students walk past. A few of them paused in their conversations to point at me. I quickly grew tired of their attention. Are you doing anything right now? Sitting, he said simply. Breathing. Clever. I can see why you're in the Arcanum. Are you busy for the next hour or so? He shrugged and looked at me expectantly. Would you show me where Master Arwill is? He told me to stop by after. Certainly, he said, pointing to one of the courtyard's outlets. Medica is on the other side of archives. We made our way around the massive windowless block that was the archives. Willem pointed. That is Medica. It was a large, oddly shaped building. It looked like a taller, less rambling version of Maine's. Bigger than I thought it would be, I mused. All for teaching medicine? He shook his head. They do much business in tending the sick. They never turn anyone away because they can't pay. 
Really? I looked at Medica again, thinking of Master Arwill. That's surprising. You need not pay in advance, he clarified. After you recover. He paused, and I heard the clear implication, if you recover. You settle accounts. If you have no hard coin, you work until your debt is... He paused. What is the word for shayim? He asked, holding out his hands with the palms up and moving them up and down as if they were the pans of a scale. Wade, I suggested. He shook his head. No, shayim. He stressed the word and brought his hands even with each other. Oh, I mimicked the gesture. Balanced. He nodded. You work until your debt is balanced with the medica. Few leave without settling their debts. I gave a grim chuckle. Not that surprising. What's the point of running away from an arcanist who has a couple drops of your blood? We eventually came to another courtyard. In the center of it was a pennant pole with a sto stone bench underneath it. I didn't need to guess who was going to be tied to it in an hour or so. There were about a hundred students milling around, giving things an oddly festive air. It's not usually this big, Willem said apologetically, but a few masters cancelled classes. Hem, I'm guessing, and Branger, Willem nodded. Hem holds grudges. He paused to give emphasis to his understatement. He'll be there with his whole coterie. He pronounced the last word slowly. Is that the right word? Coterie? I nodded, and Willem looked vaguely self-satisfied. Then he frowned. That makes me remember something strange in your language. People are always asking about the road to Tinul. Endlessly they say, how is the road to Tinul? What does it mean? I smiled. It's an idiomatic piece of the language. That means, I know what an idiom is, William, Willem replied. What does this one mean? Oh, I said, slightly embarrassed. It's, it's just a greeting. It's kind of like asking, how is your day? Or how is everything going? That is also an idiom, Willem growled and grumbled. Your language is thick with nonsense. I wonder how any of you understand each other. How is everything going? Going where? He shook his head. To new, apparently, I grinned at him. Tuan Vulcan Oketh Ama, I said, using one of my favorite Siaru idioms. It meant, don't let it make you crazy, but it translated literally as, don't put a spoon in your eye over it. We turned away from the courtyard and walked around the university aimlessly for a while. Willem pointed out a few more notable buildings, including several good taverns, the alchemy complex, the Keldish laundry, and both the sanctioned and unsanctioned brothels. We strolled past the featureless stone walls of the archives, past a cooper, a bookbinder, an apothecary. A thought occurred to me. I did wonder where all the shocking lack of female characters were, but I guess we now know that there's two brothels. <laughs> uh... A thought occurred to me. Do you know much herb lore? He shook his head. Chemistry, mostly. And I dapple in the archives with puppets sometimes. Dabble, I said, emphasizing the B sound for him. Dapple is something else. Whose puppet? Will paused. Hard to describe. He waved a hand to dismiss the question. I'll introduce you later. What do you need to know about herbs? Nothing, really. Could you do me a favor? He nodded, and I pointed to the nearby apothecary. Go, my, go buy me two scruples of Nalrot. I held up two iron drabs. This should cover it. Why me? He asked warily. Because I don't want the fellow in there giving me the you're awfully young look, I frowned. I don't want to have to deal with that today. I was nearly dancing with anxiety by the time Willem got back. He was busy, he explained, seeing the impatient expression on my face. He handed me a small paper packet and a loose jingle of change. What is it? It's to settle my stomach, I said. Breakfast isn't sitting too well, and I don't fancy throwing up halfway through being whipped. 
I bought a cider in a nearby pub, using mine to wash down the nalrut, trying not to grimace at the bitter, chalky taste. Before too long, we heard the belling tower striking noon. I think I must go to class. Will tried to mention it nonchalantly, but it came out almost strangled. He looked up at me, embarrassed and a little pale under his dark complexion. I'm not fond of blood. He gave a shaky smile. My blood. Friend's blood. I don't plan on doing much bleeding, I said. But don't worry. You've gotten me through the hard part. The waiting. Thank you. We parted ways, and I fought down a wave of guilt. After knowing me less than three days, Will had gone out of his way to help me. He would have taken the easy route and resented my he could have taken the easy route and resented my quick admittance into the arcanum as many others did. Instead, he had got done a friend's duty, helping me pass a difficult time, and I had repaid him with lies. As I walked toward the pennant pole, I felt the weight of the crowd's eyes on me. How many were there? 200, 3 after a certain point it after a certain point is reached the numbers cease to matter and all that remains is the faceless mass of a crowd my stage training held me firm under their stares i walked steadily toward the pennant pole amid a sea of susurrus murmurings i didn't carry myself proudly as i knew that might turn them against me i was not repentant either i carried myself well as my father had taught me with neither fear nor regret on my face. As I walked, I felt the Nile Rote begin to take firm hold of me. I felt perfectly awake, while everything around me grew almost painfully bright. Time seemed to slow as I approached the center of the courtyard. As my feet came down on the cobblestones, I watched the small puffs of dust they raised. I felt a breath of wind catch the hem of my cloak and curl underneath to cool the sweat between my shoulder blades. It seemed for a second that, should I wish to, I could count the faces in the crowd around me, like flowers in a field. I spotted none of the masters in the crowd except for him. He stood near the pennant pole, looking pig-like in his smugness. He folded his arms in front of himself, letting the sleeves of his black master's robe hang loosely at his sides. He caught my eye, and his mouth quirked up into a soft smirk that I knew was meant for me. I resolved that I would bite out my own tongue before I gave them the satisfaction of appearing frightened or even concerned. Instead, I gave him a wide, confident smile, then looked away as if he didn't concern me in the least. Then I was at the pennant pole. I heard someone reading something, but the words were just a vague buzzing to me as I removed my cloak and laid it across the back of a stone bench that sat at the base of the pole. Then I began to unbutton my shirt, as casually as if I, as if I were preparing to take a bath. A hand on my wrist stopped me. The man that had read the announcement gave me a smile that tried to be comforting. You don't need to go shirtless, he said. It'll save you from a bit of the sting. I'm not going to ruin a perfectly good shirt, I said. He gave me an odd look, then shrugged and ran a length of rope through an iron ring above our, hand, above our heads. I'll need your hands. I gave him a flat look. You don't need to worry about my running off. It's to keep you from falling over if you pass out. I gave him a hard look. If I pass out, you may do whatever you wish, I said firmly. Until then, I will not be tied. Something in my voice gave him pause. He didn't offer me any argument as I climbed onto the stone bench beneath the pole and stretched to reach the iron ring. I gripped it firmly with both hands. Smooth and cool, I found it oddly comforting. I focused on it as I lowered myself into the heart of stone. I heard people moving away from the base of the pole. Then the crowd quieted, and there was no sound but the soft hiss and crack of the whip being loosened behind me. I was relieved I was to be whipped with the single-headed whip. In Tarbian, I had seen the terrible bloody hash a six-tail can make of a man's back. There was a sudden hush. Then, before I could brace myself, there came a sharper crack than the ones before. 
I felt a line of dim red fire trace down my back. I gritted my teeth, but it wasn't as bad as I'd thought it would be. Even with the precautions I had taken, I expected a sharper, fiercer pain. Then the second lash came. Its crack was louder, and I heard it through my body rather than with my ears. I felt an odd looseness across my back. I held my breath, knowing I was torn and bleeding. Everything went red for a moment, and I leaned against the rough, tarred wood of the pennant pole. The third lash came before I was ready for it. It licked up to my left shoulder, then tore nearly all the way down to my left hip. I grit my teeth, refusing to make a sound. I kept my eyes open and watched the world grow black around the edges for a moment before snapping back into sharp, bright focus. Then, ignoring the burning across my back, I set my feet on the bench and loosened my clenched fingers from the iron ring. A young man jumped forward as if he expected to have to catch me. I gave him a scathing look, and he backed away. I gathered my shirt and cloak, laid them carefully over one arm, and left the courtyard, ignoring the silent crowd around me. <clears throat> okay, now it's a worry with a bookmark and a borrowed book. Yeah, please don't lose my bookmark, that would be sad. Okay. This kid's more obnoxious than Harry Potter. Everything goes right for him. <laughs> he gets promoted early. He doesn't even have, like... Orson Scott Card gave Ender a lot of humility and a lot of very, like, realistic humiliation. Like, people really did treat him like shit for, for being young and smarter and you know special and different and unless this guy gets is ignored in the new dormitory and doesn't even care yeah like like a couple of people are jealous of him and they're not even like real people they're just like and every time anything goes possibly wrong he could just put himself in a mental state where he doesn't care anyway right exactly or or like haha i had smarted you with drugs and yeah i don't know <laughs> what a what a nuisance! <laughs> yeah, he's being a little butt. Harry does get promoted early, but this is worse. Harry doesn't get promoted early, does he? He gets to play Quidditch and have a and have a broom as a first year. That is a great example. He rises to become an instant star. That's true. And also, he's born lucky. Okay, that's and true. yeah. But he gets real antagonist for for that, I and I don't feel like him. I recommend a book to to all of you viewing, um, which is, um, what's it called? Uh, the first one is called Oh shoot, Beanstalk, I think. Okay. Um, and it's by uh, E. Jade Lomax. Um, Lomax. Who's actually a friend of mine, except that that's so why I expected like usually when somebody's like, oh, I wrote this book, I'm like, it's probably gonna be shitty, right? Because I didn't hear about it through the like relatively like harsh process of what books people recommend to people you reckon that there's a reason you haven't heard of it right um but it's actually it was actually incredibly good and it's free on the internet all right so strongly recommended i was blown away like absolutely blown away beanstalk by mr lomax uh miss lomax miss lomax yes. what was the first name uh emily but e. emily lomax. okay ej lomax e jade e jade lomax got this he's not born lucky but it, um, but he did get he got, he got a like, free. He got he got a free education when he was a kid, like obviously a very high quality education, and he, he did work for that. Kid? Yeah, the he spends a lot of time with um, I don't know if you're to this part. He spends a lot of time with an arcanist who joins oh, the troop. Oh no, they're to we're talking about. I'm Harry. not talking about Harry. Sorry, I'm talking about. Mr. V, Mr. Uh, Quoth. Yeah, but Harry isn't born lucky. Oh well, I meant to. I meant like. But he does. He. I meant. I mean, like. Happen to Harry before he does any actions. Like right. Things to happen to him. Yeah. They're in no way his own. But it, but they bring him as much trouble as they bring him good, and it's pretty clear. Like, 
it's not like he leads a happy life because of it. He's he's an auto celebrity is what I is what I meant right. by that comment. Right. Yeah. But it's not but it's not he doesn't really enjoy being so. That's true. Yes. Which is different than Quoth seems to really enjoy being in yeah. the spotlight and like manipulating everyone around him. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, Quoth thinks he's smarter than everyone. And maybe is. Like the author maybe thinks he's smarter than everyone too. Yeah, and he he is he is smarter than everyone. Yeah. That's annoying. <laughs> what a little shit. <laughs> Harry in, um, in, uh, everyone's going to get mad at me for talking shit on this who's read it because people are super obsessed with it. But Harry in um, Harry Potter and the Math- Methods of Re- Rationality, who I find to be an absolute little shit in the same way, and I like couldn't get through the series. People love that series. It's like fan fiction in which uh-huh. Harry was like raised by professors and tries to apply science to magic with like wacky, hilarious results. And the first half is wacky and hilarious. And then Harry gets like super overpowered and really obnoxious. And I cease to enjoy the the series. <laughs> well, maybe he gets his later. I don't think so. I feel like that's not going to happen. He seems to be pretty cocky, even in the like frame, in the like setup, at the very beginning of the book. He seems a little more balanced in the frame narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. maybe, yeah, I'm interested. I'm still, I'm very interested to see what happens. Okay. I'm interested to see what happens in the chapters between 18 and 40 that yeah. I have yet to read, and then also what happens after that. No more spoilers. It's not a spoiler. It's just that he becomes a butt. She hasn't read it either. What? Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality? Oh, H-P-M-O-R. no. H-P- I thought she just butterfingered the word more. What was, <laughs> like... I, what was I thinking? <laughs> no. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Sage. I hope that wasn't too much of a spoiler for you. I won't give any more. I won't give any details. Why did I get a bling? Ooh. Just kidding. She's really cute. Hmm? She's really cute. Hi, Jillian. Hi. <sighs> okay. Thanks for joining, everyone. I went over 45 minutes as usual because I like you and I like doing this. This is a great thing. I haven't said that a lot, but this is like a lot of fun. So thanks for tuning in. Um, Tomorrow's Thursday. I'm going to take tomorrow off for dancing. (laughs) And there was much rejoicing. I'm going to tame my mohawk that I've got here going on. My faux hawk. And uh, I'll see you on Friday. Bye. Bye. Jillian says hi. Off to bed. It's time for the snooze.